for this privilege and this opportunity that we have to be in your presence tonight, to study your word. Lord, we pray you give us wisdom and revelation, insight into your word. Help us to find ways we can put it into practice. Just reveal yourself to us in a relevant way tonight. We thank you. Have your way in this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
each and every day, amen, that Jesus would be lifted up to his rightful place. That's what it means for him to be glorified, amen.
of your Holy Spirit. God, you gave us the former reign on the day of Pentecost. And we're believing you for the latter reign in these last days before you return. Pour out your Spirit upon us tonight. God, give us uh, insight into your word. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, making truth plain to us. Help us to understand it. God, to grow in our walk with you tonight. We give you the remainder of this Bible study. Teach us, draw us closer to you tonight, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. to uh, continue our tabernacle, just bring me down just a hair if you could, uh, our tabernacle study, and uh, did everybody get a packet last week? Everybody's got a packet? Okay, there you go. Everybody else is good? Monica needs one. Alright, someone can tell me where we left off, just so we know, uh, on the, for, for Zoe, do you know Zoe? Okay, as long as you know, I'm good, because you've got to run the PowerPoint. I'll find it. Uh, I, can, I can read the screen good if you can get it to the right screen. <laughs> so, uh, what I would like for us to do is, if, Zoe, if you could put that uh, other screen up that has the tabernacle map on it. And uh, we want to look at that just quickly. And if you remember, um, we put up a, uh, a picture. This isn't the same picture. This is actually from the tabernacle app. But you can see how vast this tabernacle was. This is kind of an aerial view that you can see in the app. And uh, you can see where the, the people would bring the sacrifice here to the gate in front. And then this is the brazen altar, the brazen labor. Then this is the holy place. And the holiest of holies would have been in the back. But if you remember from the picture we looked at a couple uh, weeks ago, the size of this whole area was about one-third, maybe one-fourth of a football field. So it's a pretty good size area. Then they would be pit, there's there's tents uh, pitched a campsite and pitched around all four sides. And if you read in the book of Exodus, it tells you what tribes were to camp in what area. So these people would bring their animals from where their tents were, where their dwelling place was, and then bring them. This was central. Isn't that a, a lesson for us? The the worship uh, at the tabernacle was central in uh, Israel and the children of Israel as uh, worship of God today ought to be central. Our life ought to revolve around the presence of God and being in His presence. And unfortunately, um, you just killed my sound. Now it's back on. And uh, so, but that should be what's central in uh, in our in our worship today. And so, uh, I want to let Zoe to go ahead and uh, uh, switch over uh, to chapter one, and we're going to. Uh, watch this again just to kind of refresh our memory, get us caught back up, and then we'll pick up where we left off in the PowerPoint. So go ahead, Zoe. Now you can cut my sound. The tabernacle. The tabernacle and the Lord gave the dimensions to Moses as to exactly how it was to be built, so its shape, the materials that were to be used. In other words, it was all of God and none of man. Now listen to this carefully. There was nothing outwardly that was attractive about the tabernacle. Had you stood out on one of the surrounding hills and looked down at the tabernacle, you would not have seen anything that was beautiful or or that, that had an attractiveness to it. It didn't look pretty on the outward. But had you walked in the tabernacle, it would have been the most beautiful thing you ever saw because gold would have graced the walls. All of the furniture was made of gold, either pure gold or gold plated. And that's the way salvation is. The unsaved person looking at Christianity from the outside doesn't see anything. He doesn't see the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't see the glory of salvation. But once the believing sinner comes into Christianity, accepts Christ, then the beauty of what Jesus Christ has afforded for us, it becomes very apparent. God had the tabernacle built according to his specifications for a purpose. He wanted it to where it had no attractiveness on the outside, but the inside was absolutely breathtaking because it typifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ now is the tabernacle. 
He is the tabernacle. Every facet of that tabernacle pointed to Christ in either his atoning, mediatorial, or intercessory work. Every bit of it. Thank God for that. Thank God for Christianity. All right. So uh, we can see there that the redemption that God purchased for us through Jesus Christ, it's all foreshadowed in the tabernacle, in the temple. Do we have the volume back to where it's supposed to be? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so we can see Jesus is typified in everything in this tabernacle. Um, and it, the sacrifices, of course, that we know from Old Testament, only covered man's sin until Jesus would come. So they looked forward to the cross however long. They had no idea how long it would be. As we look back to the cross, it's all central at Calvary. And the blood of bulls and goats just was a stopgap. It was a temporary solution so that men could approach God and have His presence at least somewhat near them. Uh, and it's even greater now. We know that His presence is not just near us like the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, right? But we have Him inside of us. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And so we have a power source now as New Covenant believers that people didn't have under the Old Covenant. God could anoint a person, as it says in Scripture, for a particular task or work, as He did many of the Old Testament patriarchs. And they did things that they could not have done in their own strength. And it was the Holy Spirit, but it was the Holy Spirit with them. And once the task was over, the Holy Spirit had to leave. Why was that? Because their sins were just covered, right? They weren't gone. The remedy for sin, which was Jesus, who would come and die on the cross, hadn't come yet. But once he died on the cross and said, it is finished, and he rose again and ascended up into heaven, his finished work, all of that, now our sins are not just covered, they've been taken away. And so the Holy Spirit doesn't just come alongside of us for a particular task. He still does help us do things, but he lives on the inside of us. He's like a power source on the inside of us helping us to do consistently, constantly, what we could not do in our own strength. And in that sense, we have a better covenant, like Hebrews talks about, right? The new covenant is a better covenant. And the new covenant is Jesus and the cross. That's what the new covenant is all about. And so that's what we're seeing some parallels with as we look at the tabernacle. Let's read um, in Exodus chapter 25. Let's look at the first nine verses, and then we'll get caught up where we are uh, in our packets. Did you get a packet, Paula? Do you have one? Yeah. Here's one for her. And let's read, uh, let's read Exodus 25, and uh, we'll, this is kind of dealing with the passage that we're covering right now. All right, the tabernacle. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins, shine of wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. Verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And Exodus, the whole book of Exodus deals a lot with patterns. There are patterns on how we ought to worship the Lord that we can see that are consistent, Old Testament and New Testament. Hebrews bridges the gap and gives us the example of that. Without the shedding of blood, what? There is no remission of sins. That's Old Covenant and New Covenant. There's a pattern for worship. Uh, we're not to come to God without sacrifice. We're not to approach His holy presence without sacrifice. Old covenant or new covenant. New covenant believers, who's the sacrifice? Jesus, right? And what He did at the cross. And we have access, Hebrews chapter 4, because of Jesus, our great high priest. He has gone in for us and offered His own blood once and for all. And remember, uh, they had to come frequently with animals to cover their sins. But Jesus went once. And so we can see these things as we look at the tabernacle. All right, so you want to get us uh, where we left off? And uh, we'll pick up and uh, move on and see what we can cover uh, tonight. All right, so if you all can find that, if you weren't here two weeks ago, uh, I 
not sure how we can tell you what pages that you're on, but this is just the one right above the nature of God. It's where we'll pick up. And so we'll give you a second to catch up there. Um, and if you missed those uh, two weeks ago, we, we covered the introduction and part of this. Uh, you can go on our YouTube channel and it's on there. Or you can steal somebody else's packet and copy their answers if you need them. That always works as, as well. All right, so the tabernacle was constructed from the inside out. God does it the same way with us, his temples today. He constructs us from the inside out. When you get saved, you give your heart to Jesus. He doesn't tell you, cut your hair, make sure your dress is long, right length. You know, get rid of all this stuff, right? Get all your ducks in a row. That's religion that does that. Jesus starts with our hearts. And once he knows he has our heart, then he knows he has the rest of us. Eventually, those other things will begin to come into conformity with his will. And so, if we find a, a, a body of so-called believers who's trying to do it opposite, change all of our outsides, make sure we get all of our ducks in a row so that we can be the kind of Christian they think we should be, you better run from it because that's religion and religion will kill you. Relationship with Christ, being born again, starts on the inside and the Holy Spirit does the work that we could not do, that work of regeneration, cleaning us up, though our sins were as scarlet, Jesus and His Holy Spirit can make them white as snow, amen? A place where Jesus can come and dwell with us. It says in Revelation 3.20, He wants to eat with us and we with Him. And so He'll feel at home in our hearts if we let the Holy Spirit do the work of cleaning us up from the inside out. All right? The nature of God. Uh, Shiden wood came from the acacia tree, a beautiful and durable wood, sometimes called indestructible wood. It would not rot. Wouldn't that be nice to have this furniture? <laughs> It was representative of his perfect, sinless, spotless body. So every detail in this tabernacle, even the type of wood that was used, was a, is a type of foreshadowing of who Jesus would be for us. Even the wood for the furniture inside uh, this tabernacle. Oil for the light. This was representative of the Holy Spirit, as it is oftentimes throughout Scripture who rested on Christ above and beyond measure. Spices for sweet incense spoke of his prayerful and constant intercession on behalf of every child of God. And we mentioned this, I think, two weeks ago in a different uh, paragraph, but it's true here as well. We need to remember, when we talk about intercession with Jesus, when we're talking about intercession for us, it's us praying for somebody else, right? Standing in the gap in prayer, and we are to do that. But when we're talking about Jesus, the Son of God, interceding for us, we're not just talking about His prayer life. We understand that, right? We're talking about, that, as Brother Swaggart said in the commentary that we just listened to, His mediatorial work. He stood between a holy God and sinful man, and He was our mediator. And then that, He interceded. He, he came between a holy God who was righteous to kill us because of our sins. That's the judgment we deserve. And Jesus interceded. He stepped in and said, I'll take the wrath that this one deserves. Me. <laughs> right? That we deserved. He said, I'll take the wrath. And then that, that's intercession. We think intercession, we think, oh, that's praying. And yes, Jesus does pray for us, but he did so much more than that. He put his life on the line in the middle of a holy God and sinful man. And he said, I'll take the punishment. I will intercede for them. I will come in and take the punishment that they deserve. His substitutionary work on the cross. We should have been there because of our sins. But he said, I'll take your place. I'll take the punishment that you deserve. So understand, when we're talking about Jesus and intercession in reference to the tabernacle, we're not just talking about prayer. Thank God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, both intercede, in meaning in prayer for us. If you've got nobody else praying for you, you've got Jesus and you've got the Holy Spirit. And that's two parts of the God. And I'm sure God the Father has got your back as well. But it says specifically in the Bible, those two people, are, those two parts of the Godhead are praying for you. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But His intercession was also His sacrifice. His taking our place upon the cross. So remember that when you see that as we're studying the tabernacle. Because it's important. Alright, precious stones were all... Symbolic of God's grace and glory toward the children of Israel. And remember, the children of Israel are who? Who are the children of Israel? Whose people? 
God's people, right? So not every promise that was given to the children of Israel is also to us, right? There are some promises that were just for them. But there are a lot of promises in the Bible when it talks about the children of Israel. They're God's people and God's no respecter of persons, right? So some of those same promises that he made to Israel, he's making to us today. And that's exciting. That's encouraging. His grace and his glory that he extended toward the children of Israel, he's still extending that today, isn't he? To God's people. We're his people today. This grace and glory can now be made more abundant and more evident to the believer, all because of Calvary. And if you've been a Christian for any number of uh, hours, days, months, years, you've experienced His grace and His glory. You don't deserve it, but He answers prayer. You don't deserve it, but He heals you. Amen? You don't deserve it, but He gives you wisdom. He gives you peace that passes understanding. He comforts you. He does all the things that He purchased at Calvary. That's His grace and His glory. And that's what these precious stones in the tabernacle represent. The pattern. Alright? According to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make, make it. Uh, Exodus 25, verse 9. The pattern was all of God and none at all of man. This is symbolic of salvation. It should be symbolic of salvation, right? A lot of the modern churches try to meddle with this and saying that we have to add our effort to God's sacrifice through His Son on the cross. And that's blasphemy. There's nothing we can add to what Jesus did for us. His finished work. It's all of God, none of man. That's what salvation is supposed to be all about. It is all of God, none of man. Anything that man attempts to introduce into salvation other than that which God has already designed only tends to corrupt the perfection of the plan of God, which means that, it, that such salvation is void. It's no good. When man starts meddling with something, it gets messed up, right? And God provided for our salvation, and we don't have to do anything but believe in what? Receive, right? By grace through faith. I believe what Jesus did on the cross, and by grace through faith, I receive it. And that's not effort. If you think, and there are some people who get all worked up, those extreme Calvinists, Oh, well, if you, believe, if, if you think that you have to receive it, that's works righteousness. Well, no, it's not. Jesus did all the work. All we do is just say thank you and take it. And that's not effort. If that's effort, that's, you know, you've got something wrong with you. Uh, but corrupting is usually what man ends up doing when he gets his hand in the mix. And that just makes our salvation, it makes our relationship with God void. It's all of God and none of man. All right? God will... Never accept any of man's patterns. He will only accept his own pattern, who is Jesus Christ, and more particularly, Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 1.23. That was God's redemption plan, as the Bible says in many passages, since the foundation of the world. God had that plan in place long before Adam fell. In the dateless past, God knew what he was doing. Nothing takes God by surprise, not even the fall of Adam and Eve, not even your sins that sometimes take you by surprise. <laughs> oh, here I go again. Can't believe I just did that, right? Because we're frail, we're human. But it doesn't take God by surprise. He's already made provision if we'll just trust Him. And we'll go by His pattern, which is uh, His redemption plan, the precious blood of Jesus, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. God does not really bless us per se but actually Christ within us. Everything is in Christ, of Christ, by Christ, with Christ, through Christ, and in fact is Christ alone. And so a lot of people have this so messed up in the modern church, and we have to be careful. God doesn't bless you because your parents are Christians and your grandparents are Christians or because you go to such and such church or you're affiliated with such and such ministry. That's not why God blesses us. God the Father looks down on us, and if we're hidden in His Son, we're blessed. If we're outside of His Son, we're in trouble. And we're probably cursed. <laughs> but in Christ, we have, that's what I was talking about in Romans chapter 8, when it says we're joint heirs with Jesus. Everything Jesus has coming to Him, we have coming to us, as long as we stay in Christ. How do we stay in Christ? By way of Calvary, right? By way of the cross. Death to self, denial to self. It's not about me, God, it's about your Son. 
And you're always going to bless your son. So let my faith always be exhibited, expressed, shown. Let it be active in who Jesus is and what he did for me at the cross. Does that make sense? Once our faith gets into another object, religion, ourselves, a preacher, a denomination, then, our, then we're outside of Christ and we're outside of the blessing. Does that make sense? God only blesses his son. And there's nothing he will withhold from his son. So as long as we stay in Jesus, that's the good fight of faith, is the fight to keep our faith properly in Jesus, who he is and what he's done. As long as we stay in that place, we'll always be blessed. That doesn't mean we'll never have problems. That's not what Pastor Eric is saying or the Bible. But it means that we'll always be blessed. God will work all things together for our good. Amen? And that's what it's talking about here. He blesses us because we're in Christ. It is only of Christ and never of man. All right? Next slide, please. God has said, it's only of, of His Son that God has said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He hasn't said that about you or me, God the Father. He's only said that about Jesus. And so if you want God to be pleased with your life, be hidden in Christ, as Colossians 3 tells us. Amen? As long as we're hidden in Christ, positioned properly at the foot of the cross, we're going to be blessed. And it's not because of our effort, it's because of His finished work. And that's where the blessing comes from. And there's some references there, we won't go through all of those. Alright? Faith. The closest the scripture comes to saying that God is pleased with man is found in the realm of faith. Okay? Many have said that that's the currency of God's kingdom, is faith. If we have proper faith, uh, God, can, God can do something with that. He can take a little boy's lunch and feed 5,000. He can take another little boy's lunch. And if people will just believe, He can feed 4,000, right? Many times when Jesus healed people in the New Testament, in His earthly ministry, He said, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And, or, or there was a Syrophoenician woman, He said, the reason why He touched her and healed her situation was because of her great faith. I've not seen such faith. So we need to remember that. And it's not faith in our faith. It's faith in who Jesus is and what he's done for us at the cross. God's pleased with that. And he's going to answer and bless every time when we have proper faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. It says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Alright, so our heart's desire should always be to please God. And the best way we can please him is not wearying ourselves with good works, what man calls good. Religious effort, self-effort. But by saying, God, I just believe you. I don't always understand, but God, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to hold on to your nail-scarred hand. That pleases God. Amen? He doesn't expect us to be perfect. His Son is perfect. Just stay in Jesus, and you have the perfection of His Son. And so uh, we need to remember that. Faith is what uh, we need to please Him, and that's what He's looking for in our lives. All right? Faith in Christ and what Christ would do at the cross in order to redeem lost humanity. That's the kind of faith. There's a lot of people that have faith. And you say, oh, well, what's your faith? And they'll say, well, I'm Buddhist. Or I'm Presbyterian. Or I'm whatever, you know, religious organization they're a part of. I'm Message of the Cross. You know, I'm Jimmy Swagger. I'm SBN. Those are all affiliations. But that has nothing to do with uh, faith as the Bible is talking about. Faith the object of our faith needs to be the person, the man, Jesus Christ, and what he came to do uh, when he lived a, lived a sinless life, went to the cross for us, rose again, ascended back to the Father. That's a living, loving relationship with God. Amen? And that's what we need to have is faith in Christ and what Christ would do at the cross in order to redeem lost humanity. We need that faith active and alive in our hearts each and every day. Such faith pleases God and such faith alone pleases God. Uh, God's not interested in you just being sincere in what you believe, even if your beliefs are wrong, as a lot of people are teaching. He wants you to be believing the right things, the things about His Son and the finished work that He came to accomplish. All right, the biggest sin, the greatest sin of all, is man tampering with the pattern. 
And you can see that in those references. We won't go into all of those references. If you get some time, look at them. You'll see demonstration. The pattern now is the cross. All right. The pattern of the Old Covenant was the tabernacle and the temple, which all pointed forward to the cross that would come. But the pattern now in the New Covenant is the cross. And there's references that bear for that as well. We won't go through all of those, but you can look at those scriptures when you get some time. God has given us a pattern for life and living, and that pattern is the cross of Christ. Right? That is the pattern. There's not many ways to God. There's one way to God. If you're going to enter into the holiest of holies, like the tabernacle talks about, where the Shekinah glory of God is, the manifest physical presence of God shows up, then you're going to have to go through the cross of Christ, or you will not get there. Just like under the tabernacle, if you were going to get into the holies, if the high priest was going to go into the holiest of holies, if he didn't go by way of the brazen altar first, he would end up in what condition when he got to the holiest of holies? Dead. He would die instantly. And if the sins of the people had not been properly atoned for, which only the cross of Christ can do that in the new covenant, he would have been dead. The believer must understand that every single thing we receive from God comes by way of Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit, all made possible by the cross. Without the cross, there is no salvation, no baptism with the Holy Spirit, no communion with God, and no blessings. So all these churches that are calling themselves seeker-sensitive or emergent or missional and they don't want the cross in their songs, they don't want the blood of Jesus on their buildings or in their hymnals or in any of their references about church, they're, they don't realize they're, they're removing the blessings from their life because no blessings come to us unless they come through the finished work of Jesus, what he did for us at the cross. In other words, without the cross, there is nothing. The cross of Christ is the means and the only means by which everything is made available to us. That is the pattern, and God doesn't have another because no other is needed. Amen? It, it's His pattern. He doesn't want us to modify it, right? It's not custom-made Christianity, as I preached a couple years ago. Custom-made Christianity. Well, I'm going to take what that says in the Bible, but I believe it needs to be tweaked a little bit, and I'm going to add my own little, you know, nuance to it. That I, maybe from New Age, or maybe from, you know, the business world, or maybe from whatever else people are trying to add to the gospel to make it more appealing, to make it more pleasant to their flesh. God says, no, this is the pattern, and if you don't follow it, you're in trouble. And the pattern is His Son and His finished work upon the cross, which all these things in the tabernacle pointed forward to that. All right? The workman, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. What was the tribe of Judah known for? What does Judah mean? Do you know? Anyone? Praise. Praise. Judah means praise. So isn't that significant? The ones who would build the place of worship were from the tribe of Judah meaning praise. Everything was supposed to be preceded with praise. When they took Jericho, remember? What did God tell them to do? Praise first. The victory in our life often comes when we praise Him first, before we see anything happening, right? Nothing had even happened with the tabernacle yet. God's choosing people from the tribe of Judah, which is the tribe of, of the praisers. The Lord has a work for every single believer, always and without exception. It is a calling. All right, we've looked at scriptures recently. Many are called, but few are chosen. He's called a lot of people, but a lot of people have him on, uh, you know, they, they see the caller ID and they see it's Jesus and they put him off. Well, I'll get back to you, Jesus, after I do this little thing that I'm wanting to do right now. More convenient, can you call me back at a, or text me at a more convenient time, Jesus, right? And the Lord's calling us, but few are chosen because we're not believing Him. We're not expressing proper faith at the right time. The problem is we have so many who attempt to do that which the Lord has never called them to do. That's dangerous, isn't it? People, especially standing in a pulpit or in a place of fivefold ministry, and God's never called them. That's very dangerous, not only for that person, but for everybody underneath them. And it says uh, in the book of James, beware of being a master, a teacher. Because you're responsible, I'm paraphrasing that passage, I think it's in James chapter 3, it says don't be, uh, 
there should, you should, not very many people should desire to be a master because you're responsible for everybody underneath you. Not only for your own life, but for their life. And so, uh, if you've not been called of God, don't try and do something that you're not called to do. But God called these workmen for this particular task. And God calls people, not everybody's going to be called into full-time ministry, but God calls us all to be ambassadors for Him no matter where we are. Even in a secular position, we can be used to be a witness and to be a light for the Lord Jesus Christ. The result is always confusion, hurt, and an increase of problems when we try to do something God hasn't called us to do. Right? So many churches, I've, I've been in ministry in three or four different states for over 20 years under a few different pastors before we started this church. And I've seen a lot of churches... Uh, they're just looking for warm bodies. And you better be careful when you're just looking for warm bodies. You put somebody to be a greeter who's not got the gift to be a greeter. <laughs> they may be turning people away from your church instead of welcoming them, right? There's callings and giftings and talents that God has given us. And we don't need to try and fulfill a role for whatever reason we would do that. That's not a role God has fashioned us for, right? Does that make sense? And he's fashioned us to come together as a body. Not everybody's going to be the preacher. There's got to be some hands and feet, right? Legs, arms. Not everybody's the mouthpiece. There's got to be a body of believers in a church that can get the work done. And, and it's true in the Old Covenant under the tabernacle. It's true today. Uh, we don't want confusion. We don't want hurt. We don't want an increase of problems. We want to say, Lord, what have you called me to do? Help me to just do it faithfully. Amen. Help me to be faithful in the little things. So that you can trust me with greater things. The choice of these principal workmen was that of God and not of Moses. Did you notice that? Moses didn't pick these people. Well, God, these would be great people to help. Sometimes we do that, right? Sometimes we as pastors do that. Well, God, you should, you know, you should do that. And God's got it under control, right? He has a pattern. He has a plan. We need to just trust him. And Moses had to trust God that he had anointed the right people for the right task. In a sense, Moses was a type of Christ, with Bezalel being a type of the Holy Spirit. All right? He'd shown Moses the pattern, but it's, the, it's Bezalel that, that got the work done. Jesus was the Son of God, but it's the Holy Spirit that helps us get the things done in our life to, for us to become a little bit more like Christ. Christ was the pattern, and it was the business of the Holy Spirit to make of Him what was intended, and that is the Savior. So we can see the, the type of foreshadowing there. All right? The Spirit of God. And I fill him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. Exodus 31.3. This is talking about Bezalel and the workman. Since the cross, due to the fact that the Holy Spirit lives within the hearts and lives of all believers, every single believer has a call of some kind from the Lord. Do you believe that? Every single believer has a call of some kind. If you have no other call, what does Romans chapter 8 tell us? Is a call upon every believer. He is those who he foreknew, which is everybody, he also predestined to do what? To be conformed to the image of his son, right? So when you wake up in the morning, you're like, what is my purpose? Why am I alive? What am I here for, right? Which a lot of people, we've asked that over time. Well, if no other purpose, until you get a more distinct clarion call from God for another function in your life, until then, just be satisfied with being conformed to the image of His Son. God, just make me a little bit more like Jesus today. Amen? That's what discipleship really is. God, I just want to look a little bit more like Jesus. I want to talk a little bit more like Jesus. I want to have the character of Jesus. And let Him do that in your life. And then you'll, you'll find the Lord calling you to specific tasks, to specific ministry. And he'll be using you uh, to, to work. He's never called anybody to a passive faith. He's always called us to an active faith. All right? That call is definitely not of the fivefold ministry in every case. As we just said, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 gives us the fivefold ministry. But it does pertain to a function of some nature. All right? It may be just getting plugged into a local church like Finished Work Worship Center. And doing what you can to help the vision that God has given for this church to make it successful. Uh, it's not just the pastor's job, right, in a church to get everything done as far as ministry. 
It's the pastor's job to equip the saints, Ephesians chapter 4, for the work of the ministry. There's people that you know that I'll never talk to. And maybe the message I preach, it touches you and it doesn't work in your life because that's the Holy Spirit, not me. The Holy Spirit telling me what to preach. You receive it. The Holy Spirit stirs it up in your life and it brings change in your life. But then maybe sometimes He wants you to share that. Be salt and light. And somebody else who may be going through the same thing. And I may never even know that person. But because I was obedient as the pastor to equip the saints, you, you were able to witness to that co-worker or that neighbor. Does that make sense? And that's what God's plan really is. That's God's pattern. And if we'll just plug in and say, God, I want to function in the role I'm supposed to function. I don't want to do Pastor Eric's job. I want to do my job, right? I don't want to try and be somebody else. I want to be the person you've created me to be. And God will help us to do that every time we'll listen to Him. All right? The empowerment of the Holy Spirit to carry out that function, whether it's one of the fivefold callings, pastor, evangelist, uh, teacher, prophet, I'm forgetting one, but they're all in Ephesians 4.11. Or otherwise, the believer must have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. All right? Sometimes it's harder to be an ambassador in a secular job as a lawyer, doctor, uh, data entry clerk, or whatever, school teacher, than it is to be in, in, in full-time ministry because you're out there among the lost people. And you need the Holy Spirit to help keep you uh, where you need to be and to be a good example. And so we need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit no matter what our calling is. Many take the Holy Spirit for granted, thinking that because He is present, He will just automatically do things. Alright? And He won't. He won't just automatically do things in your life. You have to, as we just preached this last Sunday, we have to be properly yielded. If we fail to yield to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit cannot use us. He cannot fill us. He cannot empower us like God wants Him to. We have to be yielded, and how, what's the best place for us to stay yielded each and every day? At the foot of the cross, right? The same place we start in this Christian walk, that's where we, we stay close to the Lord, submitted to Him there, all right? The infilling of the Holy Spirit provides potential and potential only. When does the infilling take place? Not the baptism, this is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. When does that take place? In our baptism. When you accept Christ, right? When you get born again, our Baptist brothers and sisters, and they are our brothers and sisters in the Lord, they even believe that. They believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, unfortunately, a lot of them believe that's all that we ever get, is what we get at salvation. And as Pentecostal believers, we believe in the full gospel, that Acts chapter 2 on is for us today. It didn't end with the first century church. We can have more than just the infilling. The infilling of the Holy Spirit, He comes in, he does a work of regeneration. He cleans up all our mess and makes us look like Jesus a little bit more every day. That's the infilling. And there's such potential. Your greatest potential is in Jesus Christ. You can grow and mature. You start out however awful and however different from Jesus you were when you started. You keep growing and keep growing and keep becoming a little bit more like Jesus until one day when that trumpet sounds, you're standing before the Lord and you look a whole lot more like Jesus than you did when you first started, right? And that's God's plan. That's His pattern for us. The potential is in Christ, right? That we become just like Jesus. And that's what God wants. But unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of consecration among most Christians. Meaning people aren't yielding, right? They're not submitting to the will of God. They're not being obedient. Not a whole lot of consecration. Consequently, there isn't a lot of leading of the Spirit. But one thing is certain. If we are to carry out the work of God, we must without fail have the operation of the Holy Spirit within our lives. And the same is true of churches too, isn't it? If a church is going to do anything for God that will count in eternity, I don't care how much money you have or don't have. I don't care how many programs you don't have or do have. Technology, smoke and lights that you don't or do have. If you don't have the moving and the operation of the Holy Spirit within your church, Nothing that will count in eternity will be accomplished. And we better realize that's how critical our church needs the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. We ought to come every service hungry for what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And if we will, He's going to do some powerful things in our lives. He alone can give the wisdom, the understanding, and the knowledge that we need to carry out the task, whatever that task might be. And we need that. 
Now, I think, as I've said before jokingly, I think you can go down a hygiene aisle in Walmart and you can figure out what toothbrush you ought to brush your teeth with. You can choose what brand of toothpaste, whether it's Crest or Colgate. Those are decisions that I'm pretty sure God's okay with you making on your own. But there are a lot of other decisions beyond those simple decisions that we don't seek God about, that we don't ask His Holy Spirit to lead us relationships, finances, uh, things that we get involved in in our, in our time, our talents, and our finances. And we don't seek God first. And then we find ourselves in a mess later because we didn't seek God. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us. And as a church, we ought to be asking God, what are your strategies? What are your plans for us to do effective ministry here in Colorado Springs? And if we'll do that, He'll give us, whether it's personally or as a church, He'll give us wisdom, right? He'll give us understanding. He'll give us knowledge. He'll give us the direction that we ought to go. But if we don't ask, we're not going to have His direction. We need to be asking uh, constantly. How the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit works entirely within the framework of the finished work of Christ. And, of course, we are speaking of the cross. That's the finished work. That's where Jesus pulled Himself up on the nails and He said, It is finished. Meaning everything that we need for life and godliness. 2 Peter 1.3 this is what gives him the legal means to do all that he does for us and with us. He is our righteousness. The righteous one took our place, and so he has the legal means to, to do a work within us. The Holy Spirit does, because Jesus Christ the righteous died in our place. We were unrighteous, right? We were sinners, but Christ the righteous one took our place, became our substitute on the cross, and so now the Holy Spirit can help us as long as our faith is in Jesus and the cross. If our faith is not in Jesus and the cross, the Holy Spirit can't help you. His hands are tied. He is limited to those parameters and helping in our life. And that's why so many churches have lost the Holy Spirit years ago and they don't even know it. They've tried to replace it and manufacture hype and, and things to replace the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing like the presence of the Lord. Amen. 30 seconds in God's manifest presence, His Holy Spirit moving, can do more than years of man's efforts and programs and smoke and lights and technology. And we need to remember that, all right? So it gives the Holy Spirit the legal means because Jesus shed His righteous blood for our unrighteous souls, all right? With the cross of Christ, this means that all sin was atoned, past, present, and future, at least for all who will believe. John 3.16. This means that all sin was taken away. Remember John the Baptist's words when he saw Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's John 1.29. So at conversion, the Holy Spirit comes into the believer's heart and life. There to abide forever. John 14.16 tells us that. However, still his work within our lives is only potential. All right? It means the potential is there, that is, if we yield to Him. The Holy Spirit wants to help us each and every day. But if we say, God, oh God, I got this. I, I already read this in the book of Isaiah, so I'm going to handle this one on my own. The Holy Spirit's going, oh, I wish they would submit. I wish they would let me help. Because they're going to mess this up, right? Whenever man gets his hand on it, we mess it up. If we would just get in the flow like the river, right? You get in a deep river where it's up over your head. You get down where that current is at the bottom of the river. Uh, I remember we went on a youth trip up to Vail, Colorado when I was at Radiant Church as a teenager. And this one kid decided he was going to go. It was in the summertime, late July, about this time of year. And we saw this park like across the road from where we had parked our, our church van. And this kid's like, well, I'm just going to work it. We can just cr cut across this river and we'll eat our picnic over there on those picnic tables. And the, it was the Arkansas River, I think, that goes through Vail. And uh, there's big stones, and there was a couple of stones that you could see coming up out of the water. But the water was deeper than this guy was understanding. You know, he looked at it, and he thought, oh, it's only like two or three feet deep. You know, he's thinking he can walk in this water. Well, we're like, okay, I forget the guy's name, but we're like, okay, go ahead. He goes in there, and he gets in this river, and he started here, and he was about half a mile down the, the river by the time he got to the other side and was able to nowhere near the park that he was hoping to go to because the current in the bottom of that river was so strong and the water was actually up over his head, deep. And, uh, but that's where the Holy Spirit wants us to get is to where we're not still holding on and, and keeping control of the situation, but we're just letting go 
like we're in the current of a river and the Holy Spirit can take us where He wants us to go, right? And we're just letting Him lead us, letting Him guide us. And that's where we can uh, do things that we can never do in our own strength. The Holy Spirit requires one thing of us, that should say thing, one thing of us, which is very, very important. Due to the very fact that it is a cross which has given Him the legal means to do all that He now does, He requires that our faith always and without fail be exclu exclusively in Christ and the cross, understanding that the cross has made everything possible. Alright? If we'll just believe in who Jesus is and His finished work, the Holy Spirit will just help us. Every day we'll be reaching a higher potential, a higher place, a deeper walk with the Lord. And there's some verses that talk about that there. With our faith planted firmly in the cross of Christ, the Holy Spirit will then use His almighty power on our behalf. And He can't if we don't have proper faith. If our faith is in religion, if it's in self-effort, God, I can make this happen by my determination, by my willpower. He's going to say, okay, go ahead. If you want to place your faith in that, go ahead. But if you want to place your faith in my Son, then you'll have the help of my Holy Spirit. And you'll actually succeed. <laughs> you'll actually have blessings and victory. But if you want to do it in your own strength, you want to put your faith in self-effort, I'm not going to stop you. It's your free will. But you're going to receive the end of your choice, right? You're going to receive, you're not going to be able to get it done. But if you trust the Holy Spirit, trust in who Jesus is, what He's done, you're going to be able to do some powerful things. All right? Next slide, please. Ephesians 6, verses 11 through 12. It says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's so much garbage on Christian television about spiritual warfare. If you're trying to conduct spiritual warfare without the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the baptism, the overflow, you are in a losing battle. The Holy Spirit will help you against all of these principalities, powers, the, the, the spirit world of darkness. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you're trying to do it in self-effort or by some 40 steps or 7 habits or 3 uh, you know, methods, whatever man is trying to give you, uh, you're going to just face defeat after defeat. I mean, you may have a little bit of a victory in one small area, but you're ultimately going to face defeat in your Christian walk because that's not God's pattern. But if we'll get Jesus and Him crucified as the object of our faith and have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us and also overflowing from the baptism of the Holy Spirit then we can really be involved in spiritual warfare and find victory and not have the powers of darkness ruling over us because Jesus is more powerful than them, all right? Next slide, please. If we try to overcome these powerful beings that we just read about, Ephesians chapter 6, by our own personal strength, we will fail every time, no matter how sincere we might be. It is the Holy Spirit who alone can give us what we need and do for us what we need to have done. Alright? Isn't that much more of a relief? We don't have to do it. The Holy Spirit will do it in us and through us if we'll just yield to Him. And that's that there's a rest in that, right? It's not us striving and trying to make something happen. It's us just resting in Jesus and trusting the Holy Spirit. Other than that, the believer is going to be ruled by the sin nature, which makes life, that should say life, miserable to say the least. All right? We don't want to have a miserable life. We want to have life and life more abundantly. In all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones, to set them and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. Really, before this, in the Bible at least, biblical history, there was nothing like the tabernacle, right? There was nothing talked about. The construction of this tabernacle was, was something that God alone came up with. Man had never thought of something like this. And so that's amazing in itself. Jesus was placed on the cross at 9 a.m. Did you know that? That was the time of the morning sacrifice under the Old Covenant. And He died at 3 p.m., the time of the evening sacrifice. They considered that evening in Middle Eastern times, but really 3 o'clock it would have been just like 3 o'clock today. It would have been sun shining outside if it was a sunny day. And you remember when Jesus pulled himself up on the nails and he said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. It says that it got dark at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, like night. And God said, and, and, and then Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And that was the moment when it got dark was when he took the sins of man upon himself. And so that was at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he fulfilled the scripture in those, uh, in those two times. Next slide, please. In every capacity. The Holy Spirit superintended all of this. What happened with Jesus even. He was the Son of Man. He was a man just like you and me. So he only did the will of the Father by the help of who? The Holy Spirit. He didn't come and do whatever he wanted as God. He came and lived as our perfect example as a man. And he, that's all he asked us to do is the will of the Father by the help of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was superintending. He's orchestrating everything even in Jesus' life and his earthly ministry. The Holy Spirit superintended all of this plus the resurrection of Christ and the ascension. In fact, everything pertaining to Christ. And so if he did that for Jesus, the Son of God, why would we think we can do something in this life as far as living for God without his help? We need him to superintend everything that we do. I think minus picking a toothbrush, right? What toothpaste? And there's some simple decisions he has given us a brain. You know, common sense things. Of course, common sense isn't quite as common as it used to be. But there are some things that we can make decisions. But there's so much more that we ought to be seeking the Holy Spirit's help on that we haven't been. And he wants to superintend our life just like he did for Jesus. In our text, the Holy Spirit is going to give these men special talent to make after the pattern which the Lord had given to Moses. All right? So it's the Holy Spirit that's helping Bezalel and all these other workmen to make these things. It's nothing they had ever seen before. Nothing they had ever heard of before. And it was all God's pattern. All right? Wise-hearted. It says, And behold, I have given him with him Aholiab, the son of Ahishamach of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all who are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded you. Exodus 31.6. You notice it says wise-hearted instead of wise-headed. <laughs> we need some politicians in our nation today who are wise-hearted and not just wise-headed. Amen? We need some pastors, evangelists, preachers in 2018 who are wise-hearted and not just wise-headed. Amen? We, we know a lot. We can quote a lot of facts about Jesus, but do we really apply the wisdom and the truth of Scripture like we ought to? That's the difference between wise-hearted and wise-headed. Um, it says they were responsible for the construction, all right? The tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is there upon and all the furniture of the tabernacle, Exodus 31, 7. We as believers have the Holy Spirit, and as such, He resides within our hearts and lives in order to carry out a specific purpose, and that purpose is Christ-likeness taking you from what you looked like when you first got saved and helping you each and every day to look a little bit more like Jesus, to act a little bit more like Jesus, to have his character in your heart. That's what being a disciple of Jesus is all about. All right? Romans chapter 8. This is the last, uh, last part, isn't it? I, I'm not looking at the package, so I'm trying to remember uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 29. It says, Likewise, the Spirit, that's talking about the Holy Spirit, also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. So in those passages, 26 and 27 of Romans chapter 8 that we just read, it tells us the Holy Spirit makes intercession. He prays for you. He prays. Isn't that powerful? And it's only, though, when you're placing your faith in who? Jesus and what He did at the cross. When you do that, you, you pray and you say, God, I need this in my life. But the Holy Spirit is praying and He knows better what you need than you do. Amen? And when you're speaking in tongues, it's actually a reference to our prayer language. When we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, we know from the day of Pentecost, the men said, 
you know, how are these men speaking in our languages the wonderful works of God? When you're speaking in tongues, what are you saying? You're speaking the wonderful works of God. But more specifically, it tells us in this passage, Romans chapter 8, that the Holy Spirit is interceding. Those words that we're speaking are, are given to us by the Holy Spirit, and He's interceding to God the Father. How do you know He's not going to pray a wrong prayer? If he's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and he's speaking to God exactly what we need in our lives. And that's why when we get baptized in the Holy Spirit and we speak in tongues, that shouldn't be the last time, right? We should continually exercise that gift because it's what this verse is, what these verses are talking about. It's the Holy Spirit ma making intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He's praying the will of God for your life when you're speaking in other tongues. And the will of God is mentioned in the next two verses. That we be conformed to the image of His Son. That's what the Holy Spirit's function is. Is to glorify Christ. To magnify Christ in your life. And if you'll let Him, you'll become a little bit more like Jesus with the Holy Spirit's help. Amen? And that's such a refreshing thing. It's so much better than this gauntlet that we have to run through in religion. You know, i got to read six chapters. i got to pray an hour. i got to memorize five verses a day. i got to be in church every time the doors are open. Are all of those things good? Yes. But they, if we make a law out of them, they will accomplish nothing in our lives. But when we just rest in who Jesus is and what He's done for us, we rest in the power of His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does within us, just from our yieldedness, Things that we could never do. When we're tired on a Wednesday night <laughs> from working and we're about to fall asleep, the Holy Spirit can begin to do in us things that we could not do in our own strength. All right, let's close out with this reminder about the uh, God's prescribed order of victory because we can see all of this, can't we, in the tabernacle? What we're talking about just in this first chapter of the tabernacle. Jesus Christ is the source of all things that we receive from God. That's why everything in the tabernacle pointed to Jesus. He's the source of all things that we receive from God. If it wasn't for Jesus, we would have nothing to do with God. We would be lost in our sins, right? And almost every person who calls himself a Christian, a biblical Christian, agrees with number one. Number two, sometimes people have a, 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 a difference of opinion. But the cross of Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ, is the only means by which all of these wonderful things are given to us. It's not because you prayed six hours, that would be a long time, read six chapters, prayed an hour, <laughs> that sounds more reasonable. Um, it's not because of our efforts, even if they're religious efforts, right? It's all because of what Jesus did, His finished work, not our performance, but His performance, that we have all the blessings. And that's what the Scripture tells us, that's what the tabernacle is showing us. It's all because of the blood of the Lamb that we have access to the very presence of God. Number three, the cross of Christ must be the object of our faith. And of course, we're not talking about two wooden beams. We're talking about the work that Jesus accomplished there and what uh, that finished work really was, which is really His sinless life, His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. It's all one, one work of redemption. And so it's all uh, wrapped up in the cross. And then number four is what we've been talking about at the end of this chapter. The Holy Spirit superintends or administrates the entire process of us being a Christian and growing in our Christian walk, becoming a little bit more like Jesus. If the Holy Spirit's not involved, we're not going to grow. We're going to either stagnate, stay the same, or probably not very many people stay stagnant very long. They begin to backslide. And you begin to lose what you already have with God. And so we need to keep our faith. We, got, we came in by Jesus and the cross. And we stay in by Jesus and the cross. And the Holy Spirit can work in us. And uh, bring a maturity. Bring a growth in our lives. If we'll stay in that place. Alright. Any comments, questions, concerns about the intro in chapter 1?